Good afternoon, everyone. This is Debbie Plotnick. I'm Vice President of Mental Health and Systems Advocacy for Mental Health America, and we're delighted that you could join us today. This is the last uh, webinar in our 2019 Regional Policy Council Series webinar. We'll tell you more about the speakers in a minute. But first, I'd like to take care of a little bit of housekeeping, please. And the first thing, of course, is to thank our 2019 Regional Policy Council sponsors. And they are Alchemies, Allergan, Janssen, Myret, Neurocrin Biosciences, Utska America Pharmaceutical, and the Takeda Lundbeck Alliance and Teva. Thank you to all of our sponsors. A couple of important things. The participants will be in listen only mode, but I want to assure everyone that this webinar is being recorded and you'll be able to listen to it later. Um, a recording is going to be posted. You'll receive an email when it's ready for download. And the slides that are part of the webinar today are, will also be available for download. And again, you'll be informed of that uh, together with the recording slide by email. And we really welcome your questions for our presenters today. Please be sure to type them into the chat box during the presentation, and we will um, get to them as question and answer at the conclusion of the webinar. So let's get started. Next slide, please, Karen. Thank you. We are just delighted today to welcome our speakers, uh, D. Brian Hufford and Carolyn Reynolds. And they are partners in an innovative and nationally recognized practice at Suckerman Spader. And they represent patients and healthcare providers in high stakes disputes with health insurance companies. Brian's efforts led to two of the largest recoveries ever obtained in ERISA-based health insurance class actions and to a collection of other precedent-setting decisions that have transformed the rights of patients and providers. Brian's work on reimbursement rate-related litigation against United Healthcare and HealthNet, for example, led to settlements worth over $600 million. Brian, who leads the healthcare practice at Zuckerman Spader, has served as co-lead counsel in other national healthcare litigation against United, Aetna, WellPoint, Cigna, and various Blue Cross and Blue Shield entities. Brian has successfully argued healthcare appeals before the U.S. Courts of Appeals for the Second, Third, and Fifth Circuits, and he was lead counsel in two trials against Blue Cross and Blue Shield entities on behalf of providers and provider associations. Carolyn Reynolds regularly represents patients and providers in actions seeking to enforce their rights under employer-sponsored health insurance plans. Her health care cases particularly focus on assisting patients who were illegally denied coverage for behavioral health treatment and include multiple actions against major insurers alleging violations of ERISA and the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. In WIT versus United Behavioral Health, Brian and Carolyn, who Carolyn, who was the lead lawyer, and the team who won a victory in a case challenging United Behavioral Health, uh, mental health and substance use level of care coverage guidelines. Former Congressman Patrick Kennedy, who is the sponsor of the Federal Parity Act, hailed the case as the Brown versus Board of Education for the Mental Health Movement. And CNN identified it as one of the most important and most thorough rulings ever issued against an insurance company at the federal level on mental health issues. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Brian and Carolyn. Uh, thank you very much. This is Brian Hufford. I really appreciate everybody uh, calling in. 
and uh, Carolyn and I, I hope that uh, that we'll be able to provide you some good information um, for the work that you guys are doing. You obviously we're trying to bring use litigation as a tool um, to help people, um, but you guys are all out there on the front lines, really providing these these uh, behavioral health services, and and either as patients or as or as providers or uh, adv- advocacy groups to really try to help promote these issues. And 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 we simply want to be able to be helpful to you in pursuing your goals. Um, as was indicated, our, Carol and I work in a practice group at uh, Zuckerman Spader that focuses um, on representing patients and providers uh, in disputes with insurance companies and claims administrators regarding coverage disputes or very other uh, types of issues. Much of our practice over the past four to five years is focused in particular on behavioral health issues. We primarily use ERISA, and I want to give you a bit of an overview before I turn it over to Carolyn, who will go into more detail about the WIT case, but I think it's important to lay out some of the key issues that, uh, that um, need to be confronted by people who are trying to fight back against the insurance companies. ERISA, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, is the federal statute that governs private employer benefit plans. It's important and indeed critical because more than 60% of people are ins- in the United States are insured under ERISA plans. So ERISA governs all the disputes that arises under those plans. Of those, most of them are self-funded, which basically means these are large employers who pay medical expenses from their own pockets and then hire claims administrators like United to process and administer the plans. For example, 78% of United's business is self-funded. The vast majority of the plans out there, the people that receive their insurance, are self-funded plans governed by insurance. Why is that important? State laws do not apply to self-funded plans, only ERISA. <clears throat> so state regulators, are, in effect, are irrelevant for them. The Department of Labor regulates ERISA plans, and only the Department of Labor has the authority to do so. So you need to understand ERISA and understand the context, because the Department of Labor doesn't have the resources to make sure the plans are doing things properly. That's why being understanding your rights and remedies and, and understanding the uh, possible legal uh, claims is so critical here. ERISA establishes a standard of conduct where claims administrators must follow plan terms, and they are also a fiduciary under ERISA. So they must interpret those plans in a manner which is in the best interest of participants or beneficiaries. If if the benefit is denied or reduced, uh, called an adverse benefit determination under ERISA, the statute requires the claims administrator to explain the reason to disclose guidelines or policies and provide the copies of those uh, to people who are subjected to the denials, and to provide a full and fair review, meaning to provide due process for handling appeals or uh, grievances challenging denials. People need to understand the rights they have and if they can use those effectively under ERISA. Providers also can have standing to pursue claims like this, but they can only do so if they have proper authorization forms or assignments from their patients. So that also is something that is critical uh, moving forward in representing it. Now, one thing critical here with regard to our presentation today is ERISA incorporates the Parity Act, which means you can sue under ERISA if parity is, is violated. Parity is very important. In fact, just today, and it was just interesting timing, the Milliman uh, research came out with a new updated report on parity. They were engaged by the Bowman Family Foundation um, to analyze what parity looks like throughout the country, and they were looking at basically a substantial amount of data for the past five years. Um, you should try to get a copy of it, of it if you can because it really has an incredible amount of detail. I've been reading a lot of it this morning. It shows a systemic problem of disparities in out-of-network, um, uh, in inadequate networks, and a comparison between usage of out-of-network services in behavioral health versus medical surgical, as well as in reimbursement levels. And it, it, it highlights how right now we're in a very difficult situation. And those ideas are, are tied together. Insurance companies are not paying enough for behavioral health services. As a result, that leads to inadequate networks and, it, and then passes on even more difficulties for patients who are, who are subjected to the higher cost of out-of-network. But parity is, can, can be complicated and can have unforeseen consequences. I'll give you an example, and this leads us to where we are with the WIT case. If you consider rehab, rehab prior to parity, almost all insurers would cover 28 days of rehab for substance use disorder. You may remember from the year 2000, uh, for those who are old enough to remember this, Sandra Bullock starred in a movie called 28 Days about a party girl who was able to turn her life around by going into rehab for, for 28 days. At the time, 
it, all insurance companies would cover that 28 days, but that was it. They had that limit. After parity, they no longer could use a 28-day limit for coverage, and so they tried to come up with another way to, to try to uh, limit coverage for behavioral health. What they turned to was something even more insidious, the use of medical necessity, and they applied internal guidelines to justify denials that gave them far more discretion. What happened? The length of stay actually declined after parity. Rehab centers, for example, residential treatment centers, show that on average there, there can be 7 to 10 days length of stay for rehab as opposed to what used to be 28 days because insurance companies are using their internal guidelines as a mechanism for deciding what should be covered or what's not covered. That brings us to WIT because that's exactly what we did in our WIT case is we decided to challenge those guidelines under ERISA. So let me turn you over to Carolyn now who was the lead lawyer for, that, for us in that case and she'll take you through what happened in that decision, how we got there, and the significance we think it has uh, nationwide. Carolyn? Thanks, Brian. Um, so I'm going to give you an, an overview of the WIT case and uh, <clears throat> a few slides now. Um, so the WIT... The WIC case is a certified class action. Uh, we had 11 named plaintiffs in the case. The named plaintiffs were patients or family members of patients with mental illnesses or substance use disorders, and in reality, almost all the patients had multiple diagnoses. The class includes people who were seeking coverage for services at three levels of care, uh, residential treatment, intensive outpatient treatment, and outpatient treatment. Um, there are more than 50,000 people in our class. We try not to get more precise than that, although it's probably closer to 65,000. Uh, and we're challenging more than 67,000 denials of coverage. The photo on your screen is of Max Tillett. Uh, he's the son of one of our named plaintiffs. Um, and I like to introduce him when I <coughs> talk about the case. Uh, this photo was taken two days before Max died from an overdose which was several weeks after UBH denied him coverage for residential treatment of his co-occurring substance use and mental health disorders. The baby in the photo is Max's then newborn son. Max's mother gave us this picture, which hung in our war room throughout the WIT trial, and it served as a reminder of how high the price a lack of, of a lack of access to care can be. Today, that photo hangs in my office. Max's story is a sad one, and unfortunately, it's all too common. But the other side of the coin are the incredibly inspiring stories of recovery that we have heard from others of our named plaintiffs and many others in the class who were able to find a way to pay for the services they or their loved ones needed. Behavioral health services can change lives, and they can save lives, and that's why Zuckerman is so committed to bringing this type of case and to help, help uh, ensure access to care. So let me talk a little bit about uh, the claims in the case. So as Brian mentioned, we bring most of our healthcare cases under ERISA. That's true of WIT. Uh, and that means that the class only includes people who are insured under employer-sponsored plans. And I just want to pause for a moment to drive home what that really means. Our class members are people who have health coverage. Their plans cover behavioral health treatment. They cover these levels of care. They have a clinician or a team who are properly licensed and doing their jobs correctly who have prescribed the treatment. There's a bed, there's a spot in the IOP, or there's an outpatient provider ready to treat them. But the claims administrator is still denying them coverage on medical necessity grounds, as Brian described. So, uh, as Brian mentioned, ERISA is a federal statute that at a high level treats employer-sponsored health plans like trusts, and it makes anybody administering the plan into a fiduciary, which is just like a trustee. The usual duties that a trustee owes to a beneficiary of a trust are care, prudence, and loyalty, and ERISA explicitly imposes those duties on anybody that has the authority to administer a plan. The statute specifies that ERISA fiduciaries have a duty to administer the plan solely in the interests of the participants and beneficiaries of the plans, meaning the patients. That means insurance companies and claims administrators can't legally administer the plans in a way that is driven by their own interests or even the interests of the employers they consider their customers. <clears throat> 
ERISA also specifies that fiduciaries have a duty to follow the plan terms, as Brian said, as long as those terms don't violate federal law, like the Parity Act. And ERISA plan members can sue to enforce those fiduciary duties. And ERISA also gives plan members the right to sue if benefits have been wrongfully denied to them under, under their plan. And in the Witt case, the wrongfulness related to the process UBH followed and the standards UBH used to decide these claims. So interestingly enough, in Witt, we did not assert a direct Parity Act claim. We didn't attempt to show that the guidelines UBH was using to administer behavioral health claims were more restrictive than the guidelines other United companies were using for medical and surgical claims. That would have been a much more complicated case. And our claim was really straightforward and took on the guidelines on their own terms. But we still think of it as, as a case that fits with the goals of the Parity Act because it's helping to ensure that UBH will uh, adjudicate claims fairly in accordance with the terms of uh, class members' plans and in a way that is not more restrictive for behavior, behavioral health coverage. Uh, let's make sure, <laughs> let me go back. Okay, all right, so in a nutshell, our case alleged that under all of the class members' plans, one requirement of coverage was that the services for which coverage was requested at the requested level of care had to be consistent with generally accepted standards. UBH was using its own proprietary level of care guidelines and coverage determined determination guidelines to decide whether that plan requirement had been satisfied. So it's important to note that UBH's level of care guidelines apply to all diagnoses at all levels of care. So every time UBH made a medical necessity decision, the request for coverage had to meet the common criteria contained in this document. So in effect, UBH interpreted everybody's plan document the same way, and it set forth its interpretation of those plan documents in its guidelines. Um, and we argued that UBH breached its fiduciary duties by developing guidelines that were much more restrictive than the generally accepted standards of care, which had the effect of restricting the scope of coverage available under the terms of the class member's plans. And we also argued that because UBH used those ultra-restrictive guidelines to deny coverage to the class members, all of those denials were wrongful and violated ERISA. So one of the things that makes this case uh, really unique is that we actually went into court and we proved what the generally accepted standards of care are for making level of care decisions. And then we proved that UBH's guidelines fell far short of those standards. So how did we prove what the generally accepted standards of care are? Uh, we had a lot of evidence actually, and as you'll see, um, there wasn't even really a dispute about what the standards are that were generally accepted in the field. And that's maybe the most important thing to think about uh, with this type of litigation challenging guidelines. Um, you know, we were really careful throughout the case to distinguish between the generally accepted standards of care and the places where those standards are written down. Generally accepted standards of care is just a, a legal concept that refers to the shared understanding among practitioners in a field about what a competent, non-negligent practitioner would do in certain situations. In this case, selecting the level of care. And in our case, there happened to be several sources where the standards that were generally accepted in the field were written down. And everybody agreed that those sources accurately reflected what was generally accepted. It's important to remember that this is not the only way to prove what is generally accepted in a field. You can also prove it by bringing in an expert into court to testify about it. But in our case, having these sources was really helpful because it gave us a concrete expression of the standards, which looked really different from the criteria that UBH had come up with. And all of the experts' testimony in our case ended up centering around these documents and how UBH's guidelines differed from them. So for example, we introduced at trial uh, the ASAM criteria, which is a set of criteria and guidance published by the American Society for Addiction Medicine, uh, which is a society of doctors and other professionals who specialize in the treatment of substance use disorders. The ASAM criteria have been around for decades, 
uh, it's now in the third edition, I believe, and they are, in fact, so widely accepted that many states mandate their use as the criteria for making medical necessity decisions. Um, try to, oops, I lost control. <laughs> okay. Um, not surprisingly, our expert, who is one of the co-editors of the third edition of the ACM criteria, testified that the document accurately reflected the generally accepted standards of care in the addiction medicine field. Maybe a little more surprisingly, UBH's own medical director, as well as its retained expert, also agreed. Um, and we had written sources that we could point to for the relevant standard of care with respect to mental health treatment in the form of the Level of Care Utilization System, or LOCUS. LOCUS was developed in the 1990s by the American Association of Community Psychiatrists, another association of professionals, uh, and it's also been through various iterations. And again, plaintiff's expert testified that the LOCUS uh, accurately reflects the generally accepted standards of care for patient placement. And UBH's retained expert also admitted the same thing. And then finally, we introduced the Child and Adolescent Level of Care Utilization System, which was jointly developed by two professional associations, um, and the Child and Adolescent Service Intensity Instrument, which was published later as a refinement on the CA locus. And again, even UBH's own expert conceded that these instruments accurately reflect the generally accepted standards. Uh, and we had, we had lots of other evidence, uh, including emails, internal UBH documents, and even the fact that UBH's guidelines actually cited all of those sources. So by the end of this trial, it was easy for the court to make findings about what is generally accepted in the behavioral health field in terms of selection of level of care. So this, uh, this slide basically summarizes the findings that the court made after trial um, in his ruling on the merits of our claims. So the court laid out eight generally accepted standards that we established through the evidence that I just described. And at some level, um, these standards may seem a little bit obvious, but this is the first time I'm aware of where a court has actually laid them out like this. The opinion is really detailed, and it's very well supported, very clear. Um, so it provides a, a measuring stick for patients and providers. It gives them authority that they can cite when they're doing battle with the insurance companies and other payers, not just UBH, but any payer. Uh, so the majority of the court's 106-page decision um, first laid out these standards, uh, and then analyzed in detail exactly why UBH's guidelines fell short of these standards in a way that restricted the scope of coverage available to everyone who was seeking behavioral health treatment. Uh, if anybody wants the specific details of how UBH's guidelines fell short, uh, please feel free to reach out and contact me. Um, we actually submitted a chart that was more than 200 pages long showing how the level of care guidelines were inconsistent with each one of the standards that the court um, elaborated on, and that helped the court to make the findings that the overemphasis on acuity was pervasive and impacted every denial issued under these guidelines. So to, to grossly oversimplify, if you take each one of those eight generally accepted standards that the court articulated, the court found that UBH's guidelines failed on every one. Importantly, the court also made findings on conflict of interest, which was significant from a legal standpoint. We were able to prove at trial that financial considerations had infected UBH's guideline development process. We established that people from the finance department participated on the guideline development committee, and that members of that committee were exhorted to reduce benefit expense and kept regularly apprised of UBH's performance with respect to benefit expense and average length of stay. Um, we also had a sort of smoking gun document, uh, which we obtained in discovery, that showed that UBH considered its guidelines a way to mitigate the impact of the Parity Act and to keep benefit expense down. So this is an example of what Brian was describing earlier, that um, 
whereas insurers and claims administrators at one time could use um, limits on numbers of days to, to keep their expenses down. Once the Parity Act made that illegal, they turned to other uh, strategies, and chief among them was uh, deliberate development of um, restrictive guidelines designed to, uh, to minimize the amount of coverage provided. We also proved up um, three vignettes that demonstrated how the financial concerns were concretely affecting UBH's decisions about its guidelines. Uh, one of these had to do with applied behavioral analysis, which is um, a standard form of treatment for autism. Uh, we proved that the person in charge of revisiting UBH, uh, revising UBH's guidelines recommended a change to reflect the generally accepted standard relating to the number of hours per week of, of uh, applied behavioral analysis that should be covered. And the head of UBH, Martha Temple, opposed implementing the change and scolded the team for not focusing sufficiently, uh, not being sufficiently mindful of the business implications of the changes to the guidelines. Another of our vignettes related to TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is an effective treatment for treatment-resistant depression. UBH reluctantly found that it was no longer an experimental or investigational treatment. And once UBH came to terms with the fact that it was going to have to cover this treatment, the people writing the guidelines were told to manage it very tightly. In other words, draft restrictive guidelines. The worst example, um, in my view, <laughs> is UBH's refusal until after the WIT trial to adopt the ASAM criteria for substance use disorders. UBH's own substance use disorder experts, its own employees, made the unanimous recommendation that UBH should use the ASAM criteria. But they couldn't get the green light from finance because they were not able to model the impact on benefit expense. So the court found that that was the only reason that UBH would not adopt those standards. It wasn't even that UBH knew that it would increase benefit expense. UBH just wasn't able to model it and therefore it wasn't worth the risk to adopt the standards that its own clinicians were re recommending. So based on all of the evidence that we presented at trial, including the testimony of UBH's own medical directors and lots of UBH's own documents, the court found UBH liable with respect to both the breach of fiduciary duty and the wrongful denial of benefits claims that we uh, asserted. So just to sum up, there are just a couple of points that I think are worth highlighting about why this decision is significant and why it's getting so much interest. First, the court's liability ruling is really significant um, because the findings that the judge made on generally accepted standards are pretty high level. They apply across the board to all behavioral health diagnoses, and this means that people seeking coverage can cite the court's ruling when challenging denials um, from United and from other insurers, other payers, they can cite it in other contexts. Um, second, it marks what we hope is the beginning of some real change. The WIT case is not over. The court has not yet ruled on what remedies are appropriate. Among other things, we asked the court to order UBH to stop using its own guidelines and start using the criteria that at trial everybody agreed were generally accepted. And as of January this year, UBH announced um, that it would be using the ASAM criteria to administer substance use benefits, and that starting in 2020, it will start using the LOCUS and CASI for mental health and children and, and benefits for children and adolescents. So the writing on the wall was just too clear for UBH to continue using its own guidelines. It's gonna be very, very important for everybody in the community to pay close attention and make sure that UBH is applying those standards fairly. Um, and we have one of the remedies that we've asked for in the WIC case is that the court appoint a monitor to help us do that. But at least this is a step in the right direction, and we're hopeful that th this kind of change will continue.
And thirdly, uh, in many ways, the WIC case provides a roadmap for other litigants who are looking to challenge insurers and administrators' policies and practices. It shows what can be done. It's not easy. It takes a long time. Um, but it is possible to, uh, to force change uh, in the right direction. So in the case of Zuckerman Spader, we are continuing uh, in this uh, effort. We have a number of other pending cases, and I'm just going to mention a few uh, quickly before turning it back to Brian for some concluding remarks. Um, within just the last several months, we've filed a number of new cases seeking to enforce ERISA and the Parity Act, and just a handful of examples. Uh, we have several new cases that are challenging uh, proprietary coverage guidelines that are overly restrictive um, against both UBH and other administrators, including UMR, New Directions, and Healthcare Services Corporation. The Smith case, uh, which is in the Northern District of Illinois, is probably one to watch because there we have sued uh, also MCG Inc., which, as many of you probably know, is a company that licenses medical necessity guidelines to uh, claims administrators. And we have alleged in the Smith case that MCG is a knowing participant in HCSC's fiduciary breaches because MCG knew that the guidelines it, it created were excessively restrictive and licensed them to HC, HCSC, knowing that HCSC would use them to administer claims for coverage. Um, next, I wanted to mention the Doe case that we filed uh, within the last couple of weeks. Um, and that's a suit that's directly bringing a Parity Act claim. Um, as we're alleging in that case, the plaintiff's plan categorically excludes all intensive behavioral therapy for mental health and substance use disorders. Uh, and that includes all applied behavioral analysis for autism. The exclusion uh, is a separate treatment limitation that only applies to behavioral health, and so we allege that it violates the Parity Act on its face, and it was a breach of fiduciary duty for UBH to enforce the exclusion. And then finally, we have a number uh, of cases currently pending where we're challenging um, discriminatory reimbursement rates, um, again, under the Parity Act. So we have um, several cases uh, we have one in against United Healthcare that's in the Northern District of California, one against United Healthcare and Oxford plans in New York, and we also have a case uh, Smith versus Intermountain Healthcare Inc. and Select Health, which is pending in the district uh, court in Utah. So those are um, cases to watch, especially in light of the Milliman report that has just come out. So, Brian, I'm going to turn it back to you at this point to give some concluding remarks before we take questions. Sure. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, you, you know, overall, and Carolyn, you dealt with a lot of, a lot of this, but basically WIT, you know, in our view, kind of shows how litigation can be effective in challenging misconduct by the insurance companies. Um, but it is a long and difficult process. Patients and the providers, you know, need to understand their rights and they need to push back when they are denied benefits. The insurance companies really rely on the assumption that most people won't push back. They won't file appeals. They'll give in. Even if they do and they get denied, they just you know, go away because it's too difficult. And that's how they get away with it. And, and, and both patients and providers have to push back, including always appealing denials. Sometimes that can feel like a sham, but you need to jump through those hoops to preserve legal rights. If you haven't exhausted your remedies, for example, you could be precluded from suing under ERISA. Providers similarly must be proactive. They have the information that's needed about the care, but they need to understand how to use their ERISA rights to push back. They can do that by getting the patients to designate the providers as authorized representatives to allow them to appeal or even to sue on behalf of the patients. So stay on top of what's happening. Keep track of documentation or data that's collected and talk to us or other lawyers to see what rights you may have. The one thing that um, uh, Carolyn mentioned in the last case, uh, the Smith versus uh, the Select Health case, Intermountain case in Utah, that's an interesting one that I think is very critical, especially in light of the uh, recent uh, Milliman report, because that is a case where we were able to get examples of exactly how they're paying for behavioral health 
compared to medical surgical. And so, for example, the amount they were paying on a daily rate for residential treatment, which is an, an important level of care for behavioral health, was being paid at a lower rate than a pretty low level of skilled nursing. Um, and so they're, they're showing a disparity that we think is a violation of parity. Similarly, for that sort of higher level of skilled nursing that we think is maybe comparable to residential, they are paying the same daily rate as a psychiatric hospital. Uh, which is a much higher level, an acute level of care, of care for psychiatric hospitalization was being paid at the same level as an intermediate level of care for skilled nursing um, and far less than, the, than, than medical hospitals. And so by getting that kind of data, it allows us to bring a parity claim to really go after the reimbursement. And, and while we, the, the, we have to have a multifaceted approach here when you're to challenge what's going on in the WIT case and these other cases where we're challenging the guidelines, but the reimbursement is also critical because that goes to the heart of why there is a disparity with appropriate um, uh, networks uh, that the Milner report highlights as well as the reimbursement levels. So it, we all have to work together with litigation, with appeals, with lobbying, with legal issues, um, and, and with uh, um, promoting uh, you know, publicity to, sh to and make sure people are beginning to move away from the uh, focus, negative focus on mental health and realize it's, it's, a, it's a condition that we should be providing proper coverage for. Um, so we hope um, that the WIT case will help sort of provide a momentum to get this uh, thing going forward. It's helping us certainly with these new cases, and we want to continue that momentum, and we need everybody's help. So we need all of you out there to continue these battles, to do what you're doing, but to keep track of problems and, and be committed. It's, it's a hard work. Um, but I think if everybody continues to push, we will make advances. So we appreciate the time, um, and we're certainly available for any uh, questions you might have. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Brian. This is Debbie Plotnick from Mental Health America, and we do have some questions for you. I'm going to start with some that are super easy. Um, but first, I'm going to remind everyone on the phone that this webinar has been recorded, and in about a week you will receive an email that will um, allow you to listen to the recording. It will also have the slides available for download. So you will be able to see them. We'll get that out to you by email, everyone who registered, um, including folks who weren't able to make it in person today. will also be able to uh, look at the webinar, look at the slides, listen. Um, it is shareable, and you are welcome to share it with other advocates and providers in your communities. We welcome that. So that will be on the way. And as Brian spoke about the Milliman report, we will also make sure that you get a link so that you can download the report. It has an executive summary. You can also feel free to read the entire report. And we will make sure that that goes out in the webinar as well. Um, there are a couple of recap questions that folks had um, for Caroline um, about what the uh, guidelines were for uh, children and adolescents, if you could just uh, say what what those guidelines were based on again, please. Sure. So the um, the standards that we cited um, that were generally accepted are the um, child and adolescent level of care utilization system. Um, let me just get and yeah, and that was um, jointly developed by two professional associations, the American Association of Community Psychiatrists and the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Um, and the uh, later refinement on CA LOCUS was, is called the Child and Adolescent Service Intensity Instrument. Um, it's often abbreviated as CASI. And that, that's um, issued by the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Great. We also had a request for um, looking again at the slide with the judicial findings on the generally accepted standards of care. If we can flip back to that. And while that's happening, um, uh, another question came in about um, if there are any plans for appeal. As Brian said, the WIC case is not over yet. Um, and the guidelines are still being uh, put out, but are there any um, appeal actions that you're aware of or might anticipate? Um, for the WIT case? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that because the case hasn't um, yet gone to uh, final judgment, 
UVH is not yet able to appeal, but we expect that they will appeal uh, once the court issues a final ruling. Great. Thank you very much. We also have a question about autism and coverage in the state of Texas. Um, so we understand that, tech, that um, state laws are different than the laws for ERISA, but um, the person asking a question from Texas was told that autism is not covered because it's not an intellectual disability condition and it's not a behavioral health condition. Um, so that they're starting to see some uh, denials uh, based on that. And um, this person is wondering um, what the treatment recommendations are and if there's been resistance around these. Well, one, um, one important thing to do will be to look at the um, language of the particular plan at issue because a lot of plans say that they cover mental health issues um, as defined in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM, and autism is defined as a mental health condition in the DSM, and there's a, um, I'm, it's, the title of it has flown out of my head, but there's a, an international standard as well, and, and again, autism is defined as a mental health condition in that international standard. So if, if those, uh, if, if mental, mental health conditions are define that way in the plan, then that gives the ammunition to argue that, yes, in fact, it is uh, a mental health condition and should be covered. So, um, and then in terms of the standards, I mean, so one of the things that we allege in our case um, challenging the categorical exclusion of ABA is that um, applied behavioral analysis is the, the therapy that has the most evidence that there, it's really the only therapy that is proven to, um, to really help people with autism um, to adapt better to their environments. And so it has become the standard treatment um, for autism. And, and so that's a lot of insurers are starting to recognize that. And even in their clinical policies, uh, insurers, including United, recognize that this is an effective treatment for autism. Excellent. Um, we have a question about um, asking your impressions of how the federal actions that have happened in the Witt case and the federal ruling will influence how state insurance divisions uh, interpret parity plans. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm hoping that it will have a real impact because, as I say, it's not the um, – while the causes of action are federal, the decision about the generally accepted standards of care is not something that differs based on whether you're in a federal court or a state um, environment. And so, you know, especially because we are pointing to standards that are very well accepted, and I think um, the ASAM criteria are already mandated by a large number of states. It may be up to over 40 by now. Um, and a lot of states are starting to mandate the use of either CA locus or CASI um, for claims involving children. So um, a lot of states are, are adopting and mandating the use of particular medical necessity criteria, which I think will be useful for plans that are governed by state law. Brian, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Well, or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, have, we have some related questions, whether or not you are aware of any lawsuits against Medicaid managed plans. Now, of course, that would be um, under state laws, not under ERISA, and Medicaid, of course, is under a totally different set of laws. Uh, I, I'm not aware. Brian, I don't know if you... Um, are more up to speed than I am on the Medicaid cases. We may have, we may have lost Brian. <laughs> uh, unfortunately. Um, at Mental Health America, we have been following um, state cases. So if folks have uh, particular questions or they want to know about particular states, please feel free to drop us an email. I'm Debbie Plotnick. My email is dplotnick 
at uh, mhanational.org, and I will see if I can dig into uh, questions around that further for you. Um, we have a we have a question that is really interesting, Carolyn, because as, as Brian mentioned in the beginning, folks don't realize that they have ERISA plans, um, and so um, the question was whether there were any efforts or requirements to uh, identify on an insurance plan that, it, that it's a self-insured plan and that it falls under ERISA because, of course, folks just see the name of the administrator on their insurance card, so they don't even know, uh, you know, with whom to file a parity complaint. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. I mean, I I'm not aware of any efforts to mandate that that be disclosed, but um, you know, m most employer issued plans are governed by ERISA. Um, there are categories that uh, that fall outside of it. Very 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 small employers, uh, but most employers are are too large to fall within that exception. And then um, government entities and religious entities are not covered. But, but really, the, the vast, vast majority of employers, um, those plans are going to be governed by ERISA. Um, and that's something that, I mean, pe short of having it disclosed on the plan, people can um, can ask their employer um, to to specify whether or not the plan is covered by ERISA because the employer, um, whoever's in charge of the benefits for that employer, um, should have that information. But yeah, I agree with you. It's it's sometimes not obvious, especially if you're dealing with a fully insured plan, um, which just has the name of the insurance company on it. Indeed. By the way, this is Brian. I'm I'm back on now. I, I was I was able to hear. I just couldn't talk for some reason, but I'm back yeah. on. Okay. Um, the, 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 it is it, it can be difficult sometimes of of knowing the ERISA issue, but prim, the, you can make an assumption if it's a private company, then you can almost it's almost always going to be ERISA. So that's at least a a good big, big good point to to uh, start with if you know the where the employer comes from. And that's one reason why it's important. Uh, you know, the, the patient will know if it's a private employer, and providers should make sure that they find out from their uh, patients uh, where they get the insurance. If it's an you know, individual plan versus uh, an employer plan, and that'll help them understand if uh, if ERISA is apl applies. Thank you, Brian. That's an extraordinarily important point. And you also made in a point earlier, and this is something when folks call us at Mental Health America, we stress is that they must go through the appeals process. So, um, you know, and we tell them, don't just appeal once, appeal twice, appeal three times. Check your plan and see how many levels of appeals there are before you um, attempt to make a, a, a claim either. Uh, an ERISA claim or through your state insurance department. Did you want to add anything else uh, with respect to that? I mean, it, it basically, just to give you a little background on it, um, there's a doctrine called exhaustion that courts recognize under ERISA. You have to exhaust your administrative remedies, and if you haven't done that, then you're then you, uh, can, you many times will be blocked from even being able to sue. But moreover, the appeal process itself can give you a lot of information that can be very helpful. Because if you use ERISA, you can ask for the background, the backup documentation that was relied upon by the insurance company to deny the benefits that will help facilitate the appeal. Um, another issue that I think is important, too, that many people don't realize is under, under HIPAA, uh, which is the privacy statute for medical information, patients have the automatic right to get the, the full claims file from insurance companies. They can actually submit a, claim, uh, a request to the insurance company to, to ask for the entire claims file, and the insurance company has to provide that within 30 days. We've been using that extremely effectively in our cases because the claim file has a lot more information than, than the patient otherwise would have because it includes not only the denial letter, but it actually has, for example, the logs that are kept at the insurance company of when calls are made or when, what, what, what one inside person says to another person about the coverage. And many times it can be a gold mine for understanding what happened and being able to allow you to challenge uh, the denials. So in our view, almost every single time when there's a, a major issue, the patient or the, or the provider uh, with, the, with the right from the patient should ask for the entire claims file from the insurance company. 
Wow, that's extraordinarily important information. Um, if, I have a question for you, Brian or, or Carolyn, um, with respect to, again, this appeals process. Is there a sense or was there a sense in the WIT case or uh, any of the other cases that you're currently involved in that as a matter of practice, the first step is to just deny with the assumption that people will not come back again and make that appeal? And uh, Carolyn, you might add, you know, add to this if there's particular evidence from the from the trial. But I don't know if I'd go quite that far to say that we're always going to deny it. Um, um, but I do think there's certainly a, a lot of pressure on when you get to higher levels of care. So, um, if, for example, there's either if it's outpatient and the person has been seeing a lot of a lot of therapy or for a long period of time, there's pressure to deny it. If it's going to be residential treatment, there's certainly pressure to deny it. But on the on the assumption you made, though, I think is exactly right that that the insurance companies do things knowing that most people won't appeal. I had a case against an insurance company a few years back where we found sort of a separate evidence is unrelated to our core allegation, but it's just an example where there is a difference between a technical component versus the uh, professional component of a bill. And the insurance company knew what it was doing was wrong, and it actually, we found documentation showing that it, it, it internally was saying, if somebody appeals, automatically adjust it to do it the right way. But yet, they also noted that less than 5% of people were appealing. So they intentionally did something wrong, knowing that most people would not appeal. And that's one way they get, a re- they get away with this kind of conduct. Um, so doing the appeals is critical because it continues putting the pressure back on, their, on the insurance companies. And using ERISA is, is critical because there's standards for how they must follow those appeals. Yeah, I think, wow. I, I, I think that's ahead, exactly Tom. right, Brian. It's, it, it, I think that the – that there's not a default um, denial in in place, denial policy in place, but I do think that the that that what we have seen is a lot of insurance company personnel um, see it as their duty to make sure they're not paying claims that they're not absolutely required to pay, and so they really make a very strong effort to find grounds to deny, and then you know. Sometimes you can you can um, get it reversed when you appeal, um, and even if you can't, that's the only way to preserve the legal right to sue. So it remains really important. Very important. We have a question uh, regarding uh, pharmaceuticals um, about what can be done if insurers are implementing prior authorization criteria on uh, medications that are more restrictive than the generally accepted guidelines? Ultimately, that's going to come down to what the plan says. Um, I mean, one thing that's, that's critical with the way insurance operates is um, is the plan, which is basically the, the insurance policy itself, often referred to as a, um, as a certificate of coverage, or um, is actually the document that governs what insurance is going to be. And so if, for example, the plan specifies these certain things require preauthorization and some don't, it's sometimes very hard to challenge that. I mean, parity is one way that you can challenge um, a, a plan term like we were doing with the ABA therapy, as, as Carolyn mentioned. But otherwise, if a plan allows you to do something, it can be hard to challenge. But, and this is a, you know an important but, Frequently, insurance companies do things that are inconsistent with the plan, and that's another sort of important caveat about how important it is for both patients and providers to understand the importance of the plan, um, because the plan language often is not used by the insurance companies, because rather than keeping track of the various plans, they apply these internal policies uniformly across you know, the whole country uh, often, and they'll do it in a way to uh, facilitate their ability to process claims. But while they do that, they often do it in a way that does not um, comply with the plan. So as just one example, um, if people sometimes don't get preauthorization, and we've frequently seen where the insurance company then denies the claim altogether when there's lack of preauthorization. But many times these plans don't say that. They'll say you have to get preauthorized, but if you don't, there may be a penalty. Some plans will say you have a penalty of an extra $500 if it's a hospitalization. Some will say maybe it's a 50%. But it's a, but it's a penalty, not an outright reduction. Um, and so it's important to see what's in the plan uh, to understand whether, in fact, they're imposing some internal policy or whether they're doing something consistent with what the plan term requires. Um, 
That's very interesting. So what you're saying here, if I'm understanding you correctly, is that um, the general internal guidelines, rather than looking at what individual employers have put in their plan. So the individual employers may have said they will cover something um, or they will cover it in a certain way, but that isn't what is applied. Correct. And, and, and you know, this is sort of a good example, really, what the Witt case was all about, ultimately came down to that because our argument was that the medical necessity is defined in the plans as what's generally accepted in the medical community, the, you know, the, the generally accepted standards. Um, and then our argument was, you're not doing that. under and you know, that, that was really the link. You're basically saying, but you're relying on these guidelines, and those guidelines are inconsistent with generally accepted standards. So it's not just in the abstract. It's basically violating the plan terms themselves as a result of that situation. So let me ask you again uh, one one last question regarding the where we have been historically and the where we are. From from what I was seeing with the cases that are coming up, we're still seeing that there are still some attempts to go back to what I refer to as the bad old days where you could just categorically exclude things. Um, and that's a little harder to do outright, but are you still seeing that in some of the um, – the types of claims that are being brought? Well, there's different ways that they they do that. So, for example, with the ABA therapy, as um, Carolyn talked about, there are plans that continue to exclude ABA therapy entirely. Um, United, for example, internally for its for its, its fully insured plan. So when it's the actual insurance company and has paid a premium, it's already decided if it, uh, ABA therapy is medically necessary, the appropriate standard of care, we're going to cover it. But it continues to allow self-funded plans to exclude it as a way to save money. And for that, you have to challenge it through parity. You have to find a, a different hook. Uh, because if it's in the plan, you can't. Ju- the, the plan basically governs. So you've got to argue that the plan violates federal law. We had that example too, where a number of insurance companies used to exclude residential treatment center, for example. They just excluded it uh, outright for residential treatment for behavioral health. And we once parity got going, and especially when the when the rules came out, the regulations came out, we were able to challenge that as, as again being a parity violation, um, and for some companies to uh, to cover it with. A the final rules, uh, they no longer can do that. It made it clear that you can't exclude uh, residential treatment, but, um, but that's, uh, that, that's something where you can use parity. Another area that is important to recognize is ex- the experimental and investigational exclusion. If there's something that's, that's sort of a, a more recent treatment, uh, co- the in- insurance companies frequently are very aggressive in denying things as, as experimental and investigational. We had two great successes in that area with regard to TMS, which is basically a treatment model to treat um, uh, depression for people who are drug resistant. Uh, um, and it, it, it actually provides sort of a magnetic pulse. So you get treatment over a period of, of, of se- uh, 10 to 12 sessions um, and it actually can be very, very effective. Most insurance companies were covering it, but both Aetna and Cigna were denying it as being experimental investigational. We sued both of them, and for both of them now, they're now covered, and we were able to successfully uh, settle with them where they're now covering that treatment as well as they provided a, a quite a bit of money back to patients. Thank you. That's very important. We haven't had any other questions come in but I would like to take the opportunity to again thank Brian Hufford and uh, Carolyn Reynolds from Zuckerman Spader for this incredibly informative webinar. Um, if there are other questions, please feel free to email them to me, Debbie Plotnick, or to um, our advocacy manager, Karen Howard. We'll pass them on. Again, I would like to reiterate that all the folks who have registered for the webinar will be receiving an email telling them uh, the recording is ready for download as well as the slides. So we're really very, very happy to do that for you. And I just want to pass on um, one thing that just came into our chat box. It said, excellent, thanks. And I want to reiterate that. So thank you again, Brian. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, And we truly appreciate it. Thank you all for joining.